Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Lainey Mays. I'm the Library Marketing um, Associate at HarperCollins, and I'm joined by my colleague. Hi, I'm Grace. I'm the Library Marketing Assistant at HarperCollins. <laughs> Yes, and we are holding down the fort. Virginia is off this week, but she sends her love and her hellos. And I have to say, we are so excited about today because we have two lovely authors. We have Eleanor Lippman and we have Terry Lendafino. Hi. Hi. A big Hi. wave. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Love being here. <laughs> we are so excited to talk about both of your books today, and we're going to split the hour so in just a few minutes we'll we'll do that but I think what's so lovely is to see two authors because you hadn't met before so to talk um before I wish we had recorded that because there was a lot of love between the two of you yeah, and practically neighbors we found yeah out. we're neighbors <laughs> yeah we found that out you maybe have to have a meetup you said out uh, um what did you say Terry well, I could throw a rock and yeah and I cool. mean literally <laughs> I love that I love that. And I think we, we're going to talk about both of your, your new books, but I think that there are a lot of threads in both of these books, just with like family and connection. Um, I said the food connection, which made me very hungry in both books <laughs> and um, just, you know, the, the wit and the, how lovely it is. And I feel like both of them are, are very escapism reads in some ways, because the whole time I was flipping the pages and I had to know what happened and I just it just took me from from where I was so it was just such a lovely reading experience so thank you for writing them thank you <laughs> all right so um I think we're going to 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 put somebody in the the green room so we're going to put uh Terry in the green room so we will see you in a little bit Enjoy our it. virtual cookies that we have. In there. <laughs> and, have uh, fun. Okay. Thank See you. you. Thank you. See you later. <laughs> okay. Hi, Eleanor. Hi. Thank you so much. I'm I'm very, like I said, this book was just such a joy to read. And um, we have some, oh, thank you, Grace, for sharing the um the cover. I love this cover. And I think that this title is just so, it's going to bring people in with just the title. Did you have the title the whole time or did you change you know, it? I, actually, it started off when I first suggested it, it was Miss Demeanor. And about a day later, I thought um, Ms. Ms. was a little funnier and a little bit more modern. And my editor right away, the first thing she said was, well, if you went into a bookstore or a library, um, they might write down the wrong spelling, but that just not, never heard about that again. Oh. And, every, but it was the title from the beginning and that's not very often the case. I love that. I love that. Thank and I, you. yeah, if you, and if you don't, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, it's very subtle, but one of the reasons I really liked it is the top figure, she has, she's wearing an ankle monitor, which is a key. Uh, this is not a, this is not a reveal. That's not a spoiler because it's by the end of the first chapter, we know that she's under home confinement. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going to get back to that about spoilers in just a minute, but I want to do a formal introduction. So, oh, okay. So Eleanor Lipman, <laughs> you're the award-winning author of 16 books of fiction and nonfiction, including The Inn at Lake Divine, Isabel's Bed, I Can't Complain, all two personal essays on Turpentine Lane and Rachel to the Rescue. Your first novel, Then She Found Me, became a 2008 feature film directed by and starring Helen Hunt. It had Bette Midler, Colin Firth, and Matthew Broderick. And you were the 2011 to 12 Elizabeth Drew Professor of Creative Writing at Smith College. Um, you divide your time between Manhattan and the Hudson Valley, where you're, you know, you have a neighbor, a new neighbor That's you know right. now. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. But we're here to talk about your new delightful novel, Ms. Demeanor. And I, I just have to say, this book, there so many connections are made, and I feel like well, I'm going to let you tell us a little bit about it before I say that. So do, can you tell us a little bit about the book? I can. My character is, the reason she's under home confinement, she's an attorney, 
and you know things got a little carried away um she um was having frankly sex on the terrace roof terrace of her building it was midnight you know no one should have minded or seen it except for a um sort of prudish neighbor nosy prudish neighbor across the street with binoculars who calls the police and um because she's a lawyer, then the judge, oh, so the police come, she's given a summons, and the judge sentences her to home confinement and a fine, and her license to practice law is withdrawn for the same period of time, six months. So none of that is a spoiler. That all happens in the first chapter. And then she's, um, what made it interesting, I think, for me and the reader, I hope, is that her doorman clues her into the fact that there's someone else in the building who's wearing an ankle monitor. And that happens, he happens to be a man. Hmm. <laughs> wonder what's going to happen next. <laughs> I think that that it was is such an original concept. I think that when I present the book, I'm, I say kind of those first two things. And I'm like, that's like not a spoiler. Like, that's just yeah, the first few, you know, there's so much packed into the book, but it's so it's such a quick pace that you're you're taking all of this in and the the protagonist is stuck inside. Was there any anything happening in the world that you might have taken some some inspiration? Well, you know, I, I, she, the home confinement, I was writing this book during COVID and I was certainly, you know, keeping to my uh, isolating. Um, and so at some point, and right away, my editor said, well, of course, this is sort of a metaphor for being isolated in COVID, but we were very careful. COVID is not even mentioned. There was a few hints of it. And my wonderful editor it was sort of a little debate, but we agreed totally that, um, you know, you want a book to be sort of for all times and writing for the ages. And we decided that there was two little references to COVID um, needn't, needn't be in there. But, you know, she has to order in everything and everything comes online and she's trying to think of what she can do and reading and maybe she'll pick up yoga and maybe she'll relearn how to knit. But, um, and I hope it's a little more interesting than I just made that sound with those in-store activities. No, I love that. And I think that that theme, I know it's not, COVID's not mentioned, but everyone can relate to that. Like you might think, oh, I can't relate to someone who's on house arrest, you know, or something like that. But she kind of falls into that accidentally. But you can relate to being in your house constantly and trying to understand yourself. You know, you're alone with yourself. Some people, you know, me personally, for the first time, you just like, I'm stuck in this house. I have to get to know myself as much as I can. So yeah. I can see that. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. And she does um, take up cooking. She's got a twin sister who is out and about and kind of bossy. And even though they are identical twins, you know, her sister is kind of the, what would you say, the alpha twin. And so the sister is always making suggestions of ways she can amuse herself. And so the sister is coming up with make work projects that help the sister too and her practice. She's a dermatologist. Um, so that she has um, visitors from the outside world and also from her building. And that, you know, you might guess it is after all an Eleanor Lipman novel. So you might like take a wild guess that it might have a happy ending. Is that something you like? Have you have you just committed to happy endings? What What are your thoughts on you know, my? I have thoughts about that. You know, my feeling is I'm the god of this world. I am the god of this world. So I'm not going to let people's children drown, nor. I feel that I want the reader to not feel like they're just sort of staring into the abyss at the end, and. Even, let's just say, in some odd book where someone's not walking down the aisle at the end, then my, you know, readers will say to me, but they, they got married, right? Meaning in the future, not in the book, but in real life, my char fictional characters in real life got married, right? So I always say, right, they got married, she's pregnant now. Um, <laughs> so, no, I feel that, um, you know, the, 
books should be satisfying. And so I guess I'm, you know, a little conventional about that. And, you know, just, and especially, there's a lot of bad news out there, as we all know. And, you know, and, uh, so I think that I, I don't think of it as escapist, but I feel it's not so much something that I'm trying to accomplish and aiming for that, but I just kind of naturally write. It's really hard for me to create a villain. <laughs> I love that. I love, I think that should be on some kind of, I don't know, writer's retreat. Like I'm the writer, I'm the God of this story. Like I love <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I once said that on a panel and I was with Anita Shreve, who was like just one of my dearest friends. And, you know, she died four years ago. And I said that line about not letting my children drown. And, you know, I met her. The first book of hers I read was The Weight of Water. And, you know, like, yeah. So um, and then I so I, I had to apologize. But um, yeah, generally, I want, you know, good things to happen to my characters. And I have the power to do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true. There's so many things in this world that we have to go through it, you know, a happy ending is, is something that is very welcome. Do you often think about what happens to your characters after the book ends? Or, or is it just like, leave no, your mind? You're like, I'm done don't. writing. I, I play along with that. Um, I, Anita used to say to people when people asked her that, she'd say, no, it, like, I, it, it's a book, it's over, it's fiction, no. But I, you know, I play along because, well, one thing that happens is sometimes when I finish a book, um, I remember this happened with Isabel's bed, my characters, it all took place on sort of top of a dune on Cape Cod. And it was, they were sort of isolated. And I, I, was, I, I was feeling sort of depressed afterwards. And I realized, and I felt the same way, I think, with my latest grievance, which was somewhere along the line a few books ago, that um, I missed them. So maybe that's a little bit the same thing. And, but I don't actually sit around and think about their lives. Because that, you know, uh, that, I don't know, I might have to uh, get, get treatment for that if I thought they were really <laughs> Just me then as a reader. I yeah. always wonder what happens after the book ends. I'm like, okay. <laughs> One of my first readings, it was in New York, and it was for the Women Act. And it was mobbed, not because, I mean, I was shocked. And it was because the New York Times had an article and it was called Readings as a, a Route to Romance or something, Reading as an Opportunity for Romance. In other words, people were going to read and to meet people. So it was mobbed, much to my shock. But I do remember someone raised a hand and mentioned, um, in, then she found me, and raised her hand and just said, how's April? And I, so I said, oh, she's great. You know, she's pregnant. I made that up. But so I love when other people do it. Yeah. But I, I mean, can't indulge that. Yeah. You, can, you can make that up. That's OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's been so much love for this book. We were just talking about all of the great quotes before we got on, including one from Richard Russo. Um, this is, is a complete and utter delight. Of course, it is what Eleanor Lippmann novel isn't. I love that. And Tom Parada said, who knew house arrest could be sexy and fun? Not me, at least not until I read Ms. Demeanor. Written with Eleanor Lippmann's signature wit and charm, a breezy, engrossing novel tells the story of two people who make the most of their shared confinement. The love goes on. There's the Caroline Levitt, there's the Wally Lamb, Kathleen Shine. I mean, so much love for this is coming in. And I think that it, they all do share that, like, you know, it's happy, it's fun. It's what we all need right now, you know? Yeah, Kath, Kathleen shines. I, I, I loved all the quotes, but one of the things I loved about Kathleen's was about like, I needed this book, she said. Yeah. And my, my wonderful editor said that when Kathleen sent her the blur back, she, she thanked her again. It was just like, I needed something like this. I needed oh. a book. You know, and I will say fun and, you know, engrossing comes to mind. And I say that, but there are so much in this book that, you know, yeah, it's, it's in some ways you're having a fun read, but like there are harder topics in there. 
to dive into and a lot of questioning of like, what would I do in that situation? Wait, that stayed with me a lot um, after I read the book. And I also just have to say the, the wit in this book that you write, I know it's just, it's funny dealing with these harder topics, but even from the dual title or, you know, every beginning of the paragraph, like she's confined on July 4th. So the moment of like, it's so ironic that I'm stuck in the house on Independence Day. I just, it's just such a fun, it's a fun one, but also there, there's so much thought behind everything. Oh, thanks. Thanks. You know, I don't, um, the, the thinking is as part of the writing process because I don't outline. So it's like, okay, so whether I'm maybe driving or taking a shower or just, you know, in getting in bed, I have to think now what, now what, what is she, what's going to happen to Jane tomorrow? And so, but I'm used to that. I, I think, um, I don't panic when I finish a chapter and think what next, because I know that's my process and I have faith in the process. And um, so, the, yeah, but the thinking goes in, thinking's in, in, in lieu of an outline. So thank you. Oh, that's interesting that you don't outline at all. You just kind of live with the characters while you're writing. I oh. do. And with this book at the end, I had pretty much the first chapter, but I didn't, it, it, it was actually different. Usually almost all of my books start very different. And then I throw that away and I, or I rewrite it or I save it. I put it in a, a you know, a sort of graveyard of paragraphs or whole chapters. Um, and so I'm writing this kind of other chapter where her sister is helping her get a job and helping her with a website and uh, not so good. But at the, suddenly at the last line, it said, well, that, that she was under house arrest and it was not planned. And it just came to me. And I said, oh, that's what it's going to, that's what this is going to be about. So when that happens, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm grateful. I've had that happen with other books where it just flies into my head and I write it down and then I think, you know, I think I want to go with that. I think I could not only live with that for the 18 months or 15 months that it takes to write the novel, but, um, you know, it's guiding me. Yeah. I love that. And I think you have a couple of paragraphs. So would you like to read? Yes, excuse me. I left them across the room. Oh, it's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, we we always love to hear a little, so I'm very this excited. This is the very, the very beginning. And chapter one is called Regrettably. Let's say there were two people, a man and a woman, lounging on the rooftop terrace of an apartment building in midtown Manhattan. She's 39, a lawyer. He, on the neighboring chaise longue, is 27, a new associate in the same firm who has this night confessed to a crush that was not brushed aside as workplace guidelines required. We'll call him Noah and we'll call her me. It's barely our first date after a less than professional conversation in the long checkout line at Trader Joe's. We have a drink or two at a nearby Mex Mexican restaurant. We return to my building specifically for me to show off its newest and proudest amenity, our tiled, furnished, and landscaped roof with its view of Central Park one way and Times Square blinking to the south. It is a June night with ideal 75-ish degree breezes blowing. Above us was not just a full moon, but a blood moon, huge and red. Man, woman, mojitos. One thing leads to another, just the way Miss Freitas warned in junior high sex ed. It is past the hour at which the building lights automatically go off. So anyway, Okay. That's as, the, yeah, and that's as graphic as it gets, I would say, pretty much. Yeah. No, that's not true. That's not true. Mm, I think that's enough to leave the one. Mm, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about TikTok because do you, were you a, do you watch, I guess my, I don't know what my question is. 
were you a TikTok fan or did you look no. into it? What did you learn? I had that? to do, I had to do research. I had to, oh, I know what happened one day. This is the way life happens. You know, like, oh, here's the next chapter. I, I, a piece was in the New York Times about TikTok being a shortcut to sort of young chef's fame. So I read it and I said, hang on, um, she who's cooking a lot and has always been urged by her sister, try this, try that. You know, it might be a way to monetize your exceedingly sad life. So she says, you know, make me a few, like do a couple of samples. So I wrote to someone, I wrote to my agent's assistant and said, is there someone at the agency who could sort of, you know, tell me if this is right about TikTok? So I had to do that. I had to learn about, you know, I just said things like, can you do likes on, on, um, on TikTok? And so I hope I got it all right. And it becomes a confessional for her because she thinks no one's watching. So she talks about how she's under house arrest and how her friends on the law, the, her partners in the law firm, she's been totally abandoned. And um, that leads to something that I, um, a cha a particular, the chapter with the bread pudding that I really liked doing. Yeah. I love that. Do you, oh. um, you know, since this is, we're talking to librarians, um, is it all yes. right if I tell them about um, Pollard Memorial Library in Lowell? I was is just right? going to ask oh, we you do. about that. Um, I know that you have lots of library stories. You're a, I truly, I was reading through, you sent this article that you had written in the Washington Post about books that mattered over the summers and I would it really made me tear up it you you just have such a love for reading in general but I know you love libraries do you have a a great library story you'd like to tell well I um it's such a little tiny one but it's one of my favorite memories it was at what used to be called Lowell City Library and is now Pollard Memorial Library and a woman came from it was either Harvard Mass or Carlisle Mass something that was like 45 minutes away from Lowell and she came and this was in 1999 because it was from my book of reading for the ladies man and she brought with her like a handwritten index card which was the reserve list like people who had signed up and it was a very long list of people who were waiting for the book. And I just thought it was such an adorable and dear thing to do. You know, nowadays, what you're going to, you know, it's all computerized. But I thought that was very, very nice. And my, my last reading, which was for, um, wait a minute, it was for the, um, Good Riddance in Lowell, because it was right before COVID. And they said, how would I feel if they created an Eleanor Lippman prize. How would I feel? I'd feel great. Thank you very much. So that happened and we just, um, they, they made me, they, we had three judges and they made me the lead judge and we just picked the winner um, last week, Labor Day weekend, the other two judges, we had a Zoom. And there was another story, we picked the winner, and then there was another story that was so wonderful that we established something called um, Distinguished Mention uh, with a cash prize as well as the other one because it was a story that needed, um, that, that had to be recognized. And I had the honor of calling the winner and then writing to the, you know, distinguished second, as close second, we call him. What is so honor. that? Huge honor, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, because you know, right. Jack Kerouac is from Lowell, so that was sort of you know, not that I'm like standing on his shoulders or anything, but um, that was that's the that's the Lowell author, Jack Kerouac, for the most wow. part. I can think of someone who deserves it more. That's just such an honor, and I think that you know, we, we were writing back and forth, and you're just saying, Oh, in this library, in this, you know, you just have so many, so many stories, and um. Yeah, I can't imagine what, like, how would you feel if we made an award? Yeah. Would that be all right? Yeah. Would that be yeah. Right? Yes. Oh. And I got to, you know, make some rules that were like totally anonymous, no names, no names, no identifying anything so that it would be, you know, completely fair and, uh, you know, so, so that happened. Yeah. Yeah. Right. All right, we what? did get a question on Facebook. Nicole was wondering if the book was inspired by a real life event. 
Uh, you know, I guess except maybe for being isolated during COVID, no, no, no arrests, no summonses yet. Um, and but it, it um, and because it wasn't based on real life, I had to do a lot of research. I consulted a criminal lawyer. I grew up with Jimmy Mulligan in Lowell, Massachusetts, who was a chief of police, a commissioner, FBI school, et cetera, et cetera. So he was my my police officer cop source. Um, uh, a, a, um, another lawyer that I that I had to consult about, um, what's it called, you know, about rights. Um, I forget what, what um, I forget what that, but anyway, about four different lawyers and um, they're all in, and in fact, usually the acknowledgements go not to the finished book, but I had the acknowledgements put in the, you know, the galley, the ARE, the ARC, so people would know when I'm talking about this, that, and the other thing um, that I'd done my research. Do you enjoy the research process? I feel like that would be my favorite part, but maybe I'm just a nerd. Um, you know, I, I, I would say this, I do research on a need to know basis. So if I'm, you know, something's in court, I write it and then I'll run it by the appropriate, you know, and I, 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 this one I ran by, it was a judge and besides criminal lawyer. So I would say need to know basis. I do what I can and then I run it by people or interview them first. Yeah. Um, our librarian friend Lillian Dabney would like to know who are your writing influences, which will probably be a hard question because I'm sure uh -oh. you are a voracious reader. You know, I um, I would say that the book that got me started, I read Happy All the Time by Laurie Colvin, and I got it out of the library, of course, and this was in Newton, Massachusetts, got it out of the library, and then I loved it so much that I bought it, and then reread it many times, and, you know, I realized later, I'm sometimes compared to her, which I love when that happens, so it's sort of, I think, you know, romantic comedy that is smart romantic comedy, um, and I also loved um, um, Carol Shields, she wrote, she was most famous for the Stone Diaries because she won the Pulitzer for that, but she just wrote these beautiful books. I read, and I found her, I reviewed a book for the New York Times. It was called The Republic of Love. I always recommend that for book groups. Um, and growing up, I, my father bought um, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, which are short stories by Max Schulman, which I still think is the funniest book I ever read. I love that. Yeah, I feel, well, there you go. Everybody needs to write those down. Um, I'm sure you have many, many more. Um, what are, oh, also another question is, what are you reading right now? Oh, um, you, okay, I'm reading, um, well, I'm reading Terry Lynn's new book, the one that you're going to talk about in a minute, and this is true, and there's so many parallels with my life that I was startled, even there's a mention of a Broadway show that was the last, I saw it two weeks ago, and okay, so anyway, but, um, so I was reading that on my phone, and I'm, um, reading um i read jess walter short stories i loved love love that jess and i were judged together for the national book awards in 2008 and i am also um about to start a book called i think it's called 100 saturdays and it's about a, a greek a woman who in from the island of rhodes in greece all of the jews were rounded up and sent to auschwitz and she survived and that's okay so um that's on the those are on the night table or the phone okay. they're great um well i think we're rounding up i think we got to just about everything if anyone has some we'll we'll see you in a little bit but again this book it was just so lovely and i think you know finding your people is a theme in this finding new connections and i think that it's just like i said what everybody needs right now so thank you again for writing it and um we're gonna put you in the green room again virtual cookies up for grabs and <laughs> Thank and you. we you're going to come back at the end so I'm coming we'll, back. I'm back. okay okay so we'll okay, see you in a minute you. thank you bye-bye <laughs> bye-bye oh my goodness this is
I could just talk forever. I think <laughs> also her reading recommendations. Oh, oh yeah. my goodness. I want to read all of them. As if my like to be read list needs to get longer though. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hi, Terry. Um, oh, uh, you are muted. There we go. Hi, can you hear us? I can. Okay. Welcome back. I hope everything was to your liking in the virtual green room. I really enjoyed that. That was fun. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad. Oh, I thank you, Grace, for pulling up this beautiful jacket. Again, I wish I was at that table right now. It's lunchtime, which is, I'm hungry. Um, okay, well, welcome back. So we're going to do a little intro and then we'll talk about the book. So okay. Terry Lynn DeFino was born and raised in New Jersey, but escaped to the wilds of Connecticut where she still lives with her husband and her cats. And if you knock on her door, she'll invite you in and she will feed you. That's just what Jersey Italian women do because you can take the girl out of Jersey, but you can't take the Jersey out of the girl. I love that. And she's the author of the novel, The Bar Harbor Retirement Home for Famous Writers and Their Muses and the Bitterly Sweet Romance series published by Kensington Lyrical. Um, and we're here to talk about this just delightful, surprising uh, family novel, um, you know, with, with, themes of or with ties of like Moonstruck and my big fat Greek wedding but it's that New Jersey and it's just a complicated family coming together but like overall loving each other and I just love this book so um can you tell us a little bit more about your book Verena Palladino's Jersey Italian love story well sure <laughs> um this one it was um inspired by a poster my daughter took a picture of in Brooklyn and do we have that graphic where we have, yep, there we go. My daughter took this picture and she sent it to me and she thought it was hilarious. And I put it up on my Facebook page and Rachel, my editor, Rachel Kahn, um, saw it and she said, somebody needs to write me this book. So I did. <laughs> and except for, you know, it's Italian, not Jewish. And it just, it was just a magical, God, this was written, it wrote itself. It was wonderful. <laughs> I audibly laughed out loud when you sent this to us. I, <laughs> I wonder if anybody got the 10K. Like, I wish we had a follow-up, but I know- yeah, I did email um, <laughs> under, I, I believe it was Lainey um, said, go ahead and reach out. And I did, and I have not heard anything, but this poster is two years old now. Right. So, Maybe he did find love. And I hope. <laughs> I feel like there's some kind of like Schrodinger's cat where maybe we shouldn't hear back just because we don't want to know <laughs> if it's not love. But I really, I, I have hope. I have hope that he found love. Well, another funny story about this is the book was originally titled, Is Your Grandfather Single and Looking for Love? And everybody loved that title, but it kept ending up in spam because it was kind of porny. <laughs> I, I mean I could see the issue with that yeah, yeah I could see it yeah so I do I really love my title so I'm happy <laughs> yeah it's great I love it and it tells it like just exactly what you're getting which is mm -hmm. kind of a twisty family drama with so much packed into it but I think that it it's just such a and it's like, I, I keep saying escapism, but I think it's so true. Like I want to curl up in it. And um, I think one thing we should definitely talk about is at the beginning of each chapter, there's words. Do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, one of the things that started me with this was, oh, good. I like that better. <laughs> um, these words. I mean, my dad has always said, I mean, it's a school of macaroon. And I always thought it was something he made up and skept on Gorp. And then I found out years later that these are actually words. They're just garbled from Italian. Uh, Scuola macaroon is a colander and it means strain the pasta or strain the macaroni. I always called it macaroni. But it's, it just fascinates me. Words in general do, obviously. But... Um, just all this Jersey Italian stuff, it's so funny to find out these are real words. 
it's not just my family. <laughs> yeah, I had a blast with this. Um, I my dad's side of the family is quite Italian, um, as you can see by my last name. And I <laughs> remember texting. I sent him a photo when Chooch came up, and I, I was like, "Do you see this? Like, it's not just you." And he he was like, he was like, "Yeah, I know a few of those. I know a few of those." <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Yes." laughs> but it was really fun. I started I started tallying how many I knew, and I I did. Um, start to get lost a, a little bit of the way there because I'm not Jersey Italian. So there were some very specific words there. <laughs> it's really funny how specific things are. Like if you live in Pennsylvania, the words are similar, but not the same. And I mean, Boston Italian and New York Italian, it's, it's amazing. It's crazy. Oh yeah, that is interesting. Well, I loved it too, because it kind of felt like a, a marker for the book, the chapter. So you could kind of find it and be like oh I found it it was a little <laughs> bit like a like a search and find <laughs> <laughs> oh um so I think yeah so let's so I have to say I wonder like write down a family tree I think I need one for all of this fam mm -hmm. all the family members so several of them are looking and, and finding love in very unexpected places and um they are kind of boisterous in some ways and very fun what are the qualities of like an Italian family in Jersey that you like want to come through? Like, what are these family values in, for this family? I think the very first thing that comes to my head thinking about Jersey Italian families is loud. You're very loud. It's unbelievable how loud we are. It's not a stereotype, it's real. But you know, we're, we're very loving and smothering at the same time. And it, we're just a contradiction. We're a constant contradiction because it all comes what this comes with this all the time. And generally there's nothing else I would want to be. <laughs> I, that, that's so sweet. I, I love that. It's like, yeah, there's maybe stereotypes or things coming in, but there's nothing else you'd rather be. I love that. <laughs> and the stereotypes are there for a reason. They're, you know. <laughs> mm. Well, I love it. There was one word, I can't even think of the word right now, but you were like, we can use this. Like you can use this. Um, There's a few of those. Yeah. Boomba yeah. is one. Mm. Yeah. Well, also like speaking of things you can and cannot say, I really enjoyed the conversations because there's intergenerational conversations in this book, which really take a focus. And I love seeing the different, different generations like, realizing things or or learning from each other but I I really appreciate the conversation about you know like racism and stereotypes and what you can and can't say is that something that kind of came natural when you were writing or something you kind of wanted to focus on I did want to focus on that because a lot of us are accidental racists I mean when I was a kid we said words that I would never have let my kids say but you know it was just what people said back then and you know, my grandfather, till the day he died, he, you know, there were certain words that he used, like colored instead of black or African-American, that, you know, people look at you funny, but he didn't mean it as any way. But that whole conversation about being an accidental racist is something that's actually taken place in my family. <laughs> so... Mine too. Don't I won't name names, mom. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah, I but I think it. that opens a conversation, right? Like if mm -hmm. you're having, especially for book clubs, I think this book is great. But I think of it as like giving it to, to family, like you say, of no, like it's it's not to be of a fault, but it's just conversations to have. And so I think mm -hmm. it's great to open up those conversations. And say, look, we have we have this scene. Let's talk about it in our life. So yeah, I love it. <laughs> And I think well, that's like the that. whole thing. It's that if you're doing it unintentionally, it's one thing, but if you're still doing it after being told otherwise, then you're kind of being a jerk. <laughs> and I think that um, that conversation that we were talking about in particular here was so candid. And I absolutely love that about these characters and their dialogue. It just felt very real. And I thought the characters were so well-developed and they were com like complicated and messy and it was just really beautiful to like read and it felt very much like like again I felt very much like I was listening to my family fight um you had one line in particular that said 
I love you very much, but I don't really like you right now or something like <laughs> that. And I was like, how many times did I hear that growing up? From my <laughs> um, and again, it was just one of those really, really beautiful moments for the, the characters. And I guess I was wondering, at least throughout reading it, are these characters based off of people in your life or was it just kind of it's more like a conglomeration of everybody. My mom keeps saying, so which one am I? <laughs> it's like, you're you're not any one person, but there's a lot of, you know, everybody in my family, there's a little bit of everybody in everybody and there's a little bit of me in all of them. So yeah, not no one person in particular, but they're all gonna think it's them. <laughs> Be some interesting dinner conversations. Oh, yeah. For better or for worse. <laughs> Everybody's trying to pick out who they are. But oh yeah. That's funny. Um we have oh we have lots of questions. So let's see. Oh, someone said they're very they really hope that that man found love in his in a low in this very lonely time. And I agree. That was very nice to say. If I ever get an answer back, I will make sure. I yes, give it to you. please let us know and we will tell them on Facebook Live. So <laughs> keep coming back to here. Hopefully, again, I have hope. I'm a little scared to find out any other answer. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, how did you come up with the title? Well, as I said before, the title was Is Your Grandfather Singer I'm Looking for Love? And Rachel and I, my editor, um, we just went back and forth and back and forth. And she said, I finally have it. I was staring at the ceiling all night long, trying to come up with something. And this was her, she came up with this. And I was just like, this is perfect. It says exactly what the book is. Yeah. Better than I think the other. Rachel is fantastic and that does not surprise me at all. She she also came up with uh, the Bar Harbor one. That was also her. That <laughs> one's so great. And I think, you know, it's kind of a mouthful, but in a way it's just like a comforting thing to say. Like it rolls off the tongue. <laughs> She's great. Yeah. Um, um, Nicole Derry Williams wants to know, do you outline your books or do you write by the seat of your pants? I'm a pantser. I do not outline. I, I do basic, oh, this is what it's going to be about. And maybe I'll write a couple of paragraphs and then I'll write a couple of character sketches kind of thing. And pretty much that's it. I'll take notes as I go, things that I want to happen. But other than that, yeah, it's, I don't outline. <laughs> I also saw um, Grace DeFino asks, what was your favorite word that you found or included? <laughs> <laughs> That's my daughter. <laughs> um, my favorite one, I have to say, is Pichadil. <laughs> because it, it was one of those words when I was a kid, it was just our family said it. And I actually heard it on The Sopranos. And he said it. And then looking it up was just, it was so hard because Southern Italian, Northern Italian, all this stuff. I actually had people in Italy and Italian speakers here. I try to find the root words. And that one was hard to find the root for because it could be so many different euphemisms. And that was, that was the most fun one. Interesting. What, what was the word again? Can you say it one more? Pichadil. Should you? It's, wow. Yeah, it's a little boys, you know. <laughs> oh, wow. That's really interesting with like root words. So did you have to, did you do that a lot with a lot of the words? Like, was it yeah. hard to find any root words of stuff? Um, sometimes when, it, when I could not find the root, um, the original Italian, um, I would go to my people in Italy and say, okay, where did this come from? And I mean, pizza deal can be anything from little fish to a pea, like pea pod, um, a shovel. I mean, there's so many words it could be that fit. So I kind of narrowed it down. Interesting. Um, okay, have Grace any other questions? Um, somebody asked you, who your um, favorite character is. And I love that question, but I also wanna know who your favorite character is and 
if you had to choose one character to be your best friend, who would it be if those are not the same character? Oh my goodness, that's so hard. <laughs> um, I love Polly. That was my answer too. <laughs> I love Polly. I love Sylvia. She's hilarious. But Polly is just, he's my heart. <laughs> He was truly a gem to read about and so sweet and genuine. And yeah, he would definitely be my answer too. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, which authors do you always follow or like favorite favorite authors? Well, it's hard. Well, uh, Wiley Cash, I will buy anything that he writes. Um, but I'm, I'm a real fantasy nerd. I love fantasy and, you know, Neil Gaiman and uh, Patricia McGillip. She's unfortunately no longer with us, but I have all her books on my shelf. But um, yeah, there's there's a few that I love Leifanger. Um, I'm trying to think. I had it written down before. <laughs> now I can't find it. It's always one of those that like I have it in my head and when someone asks, it's yeah, like exactly. everything left my head, but yeah, I get that. Um, is there, are you reading anyone in particular at the moment that you're just like excited to get back to? Um, actually I just finished Matt Haig's, um, How to Stop Time. Oh, that's so good. It was so good. I loved it. I can't stop thinking about it. Uh, right now I'm reading a book club book. It is, uh, All The More You Know by Beth Gutchen. Not The More You Know. Is it The More You Know? I can't remember, but it's really good. It's a ghost story. It's awesome. And that's our book club book. Is that a, is that a friend book club or a yeah, friend book club? Yeah. Nice. That's something that has come out of the pandemic for me is just being able to reach all my friends everywhere. We, we started a book club and, and that was really interesting. So I love to hear about other people's book clubs happening. We've been together since 2002. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Your 20th year, right? Yeah. Wow. This is our 20th. Wow. Actually, wow. next month is our 20th anniversary. Are you going to do anything big for it? I don't know. I'll have to talk to them when I see them. <laughs> wow. And it's in person? Like, you. Yeah. Yeah. I love that's that. That's amazing. 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. You got to get some like streamers or something. <laughs> is there a favorite, is there a, a genre you, you lean towards more in the book club or just all of the books? Uh, it just, it's generally literary fiction, book club, commercial fiction kind of stuff. Um, every once in a while we try to sneak in a dystopian something or other, but uh, yeah, generally normal book club stuff, which is good because if I were left up to my own devices, I'd probably read fantasy almost all the time. <laughs> so it's good to that I'm reading in my own genre that I'm writing in. It's yeah. a good thing. Yeah, yeah, that is true. But book, yeah, book clubs will get you out of your comfort zone too, and you can talk about mm -hmm. it. That's another good, good one. Um, and I know all of our librarians watching are they know all about book clubs, and so this is <laughs> this is inspiration for all of theirs. Twenty years. Oh my god, you're gonna have to come speak to them and tell them what makes what how to make a book club last. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We also got a question from Debbie that says, is there a character you love to hate? Oh, hmm. In this book, let me think. I can't think of anybody I would hate. They were all pretty lovable. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, no, no haters in this one. <laughs> I um, also was I asked you earlier, but I think that it's very funny without spoiling anything um, that your hair is purple and that will come into play in the book. And <laughs> it also matches the jacket of the book. And I love that. So. <laughs> I actually, by this time of year, I'm usually blue. Um, okay. But I kept okay. it purple, specific, <laughs> or the magenta color for this. I just did it the other day. <laughs> Wonderful. I love it. <laughs> yeah, I've been doing it a long time. It's fun. I used to get a lot of weird looks and now I get a lot of people saying, I love your hair. <laughs> I love it. It matches the cover. So yeah. Yep. 
Um, you were saying that they had, we maybe, maybe we, I can't remember if we talked about this before we were on or not, but they had different colors for the cover. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the two, there were two, three, one was red, one was this color, and I think one was just slightly darker, or that could just be my eyes. Um, <laughs> but when they, that, when they picked this one, I was so happy. I love, just love it. The other one was awesome too. I would have loved that one too, but this one, I just love it. There's so much movement, you know? Yeah. Well, I do want to read this amazing quote by Jill McQuirkle. Um, so this is a fun and fun and funny, wonderfully exuberant and incredibly wise. These endearing characters, their voices and stories will be with me for a long time to come. I didn't want to say goodbye. And so I kind of have the same question we asked Eleanor earlier. Do, do you think about your characters after you finish or you just kind of like, do. you do, they follow. I do. I miss, I mean, I still miss from the, the Bar Harbor retirement home. I miss Olivia. I love her and I miss these characters. I, I just, you know, when I was writing fantasy, there's, it was a trilogy. So you got to revisit them through the next books, but you don't really do that with this sort of in this genre. And I do miss them. I really do. Yeah, that's true. I guess you have, you don't really get to do sequels very often. I'm sure some people do, but mm -hmm. maybe you should. Maybe you should have a crossover. Both of those people <laughs> should meet in both books. I was, this was one of those books where I was so grateful for an epilogue because it, when I ended, I was just like, I need to know what's next. And I was <laughs> so glad it was, it was very, very relieving to me to read. So <laughs> oh, good. You know, it's funny with epilogues is oh, so many people skip them. And I remember many I know, years ago, my daughter read The Handmaid's Tale and she skipped the epilogue. It was like, you missed the whole ending. <laughs> that is like the one book too that you really want to make sure you read the epilogue for. Yeah. Oh my God. I wasn't really aware that people didn't read epilogues. Prologues and epilogues. And even those things in the, like my word things in the front of each chapter, people skip them. Mm. It's like, just get me to the story. I don't know. I think you miss a lot, but. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, Especially usually epilogues, I feel don't have anything crazy to reveal so usually it's a safe space to be in an epilogue so that's <laughs> interesting maybe some people are like I just don't want to know I don't want to know if it worked out <laughs> um I speaking of uh you said your daughter she Grace said question from Ryan Aerosmith would you ever consider revisiting a character like a specific character in another book um I don't know, to be honest, but there's, I mean, there's always some place for it to go. I could think, and now that that question came up, thank you, Ryan. Um, I can think of a million things that I would love to do, but then I think about, uh, do you want to ruin a good thing? <laughs> Everything you. is good right now. <laughs> Everything's an epilogue. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> what it's worth, I would read a Donatella sequel. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Donatella is pretty awesome. She is a character. I love, um, I love Donatella that she is such an unapologetic mess. I yeah, absolutely. I, I really adored her. I would say she was like my second favorite character under Polly. So <laughs> <laughs> she was just wonderful and very funny too. Very, very funny. Oh, I'm glad you liked her. I was afraid people weren't going to like her because she's kind of, I don't know. She's a little bit of a jerk sometimes. I think that makes it more real though. You know, like, yeah, some people, like some things you say, you're like, ah, oh, that was a jerky thing to say. I don't know why I said it. Like, I think it makes <laughs> it real. And I didn't, that wouldn't turn me off, I don't think. But yeah. Um, yeah, we have one. So I think we have time for one more question. And Nicole said, Grace, thank you for sending your mom a picture of that poster, one. <laughs> and I love so much that your daughter joined us because it yes, really, truly really is a family, you know? We're <laughs> very together. close, very, very close. I love it. We're talking about family. It's just, it all, it works out. Um, but Nicole also said, do you, did you know you always wanted to be a writer? And is there a book that you read that inspired you? I have always wanted to be a writer from the time I was very little. My mom can tell you she had it until very recently. She lost it someplace, but my little staple together, the fire breathing dragon. <laughs> but there have been so many, so many influential books that, I mean, to list them 
all books are influential when you're, I think when you're a writer, whether you're writing fantasy or romance or literary fiction, anything can be inspiration and they really all are. When you said that, a little heart went up on the screen on Facebook. And I love that where, when you said anybody, any book you read should be an inspiration. And I think that's something that is really hard to put into words, which you so elegant, elegantly did, but it's so hard to say, like when you're such a voracious reader, like everything should affect you, no matter if it's your favorite book, your least favorite book, like everything should affect you. And I, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say it like that. So that's, <laughs> I love that. Oh, yay. <laughs> I love that. Um, so I think we're kind of running out of time, but we had so many great questions. Thank you, Grace, again for joining us. <laughs> and um thank you again. Grace, is there any our Grace, sorry. <laughs> I was like, which one? <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to say before we bring her bring Eleanor back I don't think so but thank you for chatting with us and this book was such a fun read for me I, I, oh, really thanks. I, had so much fun. I think I might buy my grandma a copy I don't know if she'll actually read it but <laughs> she'll be like I do you think I can read this print it's so small I can feel I can feel it already I'm gonna get yelled at but I'm gonna do I it I think in there's gonna be a large print <laughs> yes oh, perfect perfect <laughs> or the audio you know yeah Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I can get her mm -hmm. an audio book. <laughs> that's the only one my dad reads my books. Oh, it's really? <laughs> Sometimes I read a book and I still want to go back and, and listen to the audio. I just love hearing both. Um, this would be fun to hear all of the words in the front too. So, <laughs> you know, because I, I might not say it in my head the right way. But, um, all right. Well, thank you so much. Like I said, this one's just such a, a lovely read and we um, thank you for taking the time to talk to us and for writing the book. Um, oh, thank I you. Encourage everyone, if you haven't already, download a copy, Librarians. You can get both of these books on Adobe and Nick Alley and, and um, you, your afternoon will be booked. So. <laughs> Bad joke. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure. Okay, we're going to bring Eleanor back on and go back to everything um all the love in the comments are just so great hi Eleanor hello back. <laughs> oh my goodness I can't believe the hour is up that's that went fast hi, Always just... huh well I mean you are neighbors so you know you can see each other all the time but thank you for taking the time to talk to us and come virtually to all of our librarians. I know, as you can see from all the love that they're, they love these books and um, they're excited to, to keep sharing them. <laughs> well, thank you. We love librarians. You're our friends. <laughs> yeah, we are that I know I, um, that essay that the, I, I think is um, the link to it is up. It, it begins, the lead of the essay is how my father, it, talked the head librarian into letting us take books out for the entire summer for 10 weeks and there's no re rhyme or reason for that you know he got a two-week vacation always the first two weeks in July so for some reason anyway and the librarian indulged us and um so that's every summer we, we had to truck we had a trunk full of books heading up to whatever little cabin we were renting on some lake Oh, that. These are these are your people. The the librarians couldn't have a greater, more thoughtful question asking, excited audience. And I know that they the love for librarians is coming through their screen. So they they definitely know it. And um, thank you again. And we just before we say goodbye, we have a little um, housekeeping. So stick with us, Grace. Can you show our next event? Just a reminder to everybody that we are not coming back until our next Facebook Live. Um, thank you, Grace. On the 27th with Catherine Newman, author of We All Want Possible Things. This book is, I. it's just so affecting. It's, you know, it has a little bit of a, a sadder subject, but it's so witty and funny at the end, at the bottom of it. There are two friends who have known each other forever and one is sick and the other one's trying to get her through but it's a contract you make with this book. It's really beautifully written and I can't wait to talk to Catherine. We're gonna put a link of, of a library story she wrote for oprah.com 
I would read it all to you right here if I had time. It's so beautiful. And this is not one you don't want to miss. You don't want to miss any of them, but just very much come. It's our Gallic Club selection. So you can do that. We'll put the links in, um, everywhere you're watching for that article and for the event. We're also doing Zoom. Just a reminder for any of your colleagues not on Facebook, you can um, use that as a, a backup link for them. So thank you for sticking with us. And thank you, Terry Lynn and Eleanor. And I don't want to go, but we have to. <laughs> OK, thank you. Thank you. This was great. And um, so great that people are able to get an advanced copy and read of the books. You know, that's not everybody has that privilege. So thank you. Well, thank you for saying that is something thank you. that librarians okay, have. Bye bye. Thank we'll you. Put those links there too. <laughs> okay. Bye bye. <laughs>